الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين In the past several weeks we have been covering the theme of the essence of Islam and particularly in the past fewer weeks we were covering the basic characteristics of a Muslim who represents his Islam a Muslim who is solid in his manners clear in his faith he is clear in his understanding of Islam he knows that Islam is a comprehensive total way of life he understands that the ultimate preferences for anything for this life or the hereafter comes in two sources the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. and today we are going to continue to cover the rest of the criteria of being a Muslim what constitutes the character of a Muslim very important that we follow through trying to develop all of this the following criteria is for the person to be accurate and correct in his worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to worship him, saying, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا ليعبدون. So the ultimate purpose of our creation is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as such, one should never squander a minute in which he or she is not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us think that worshipping is to do your prayer, to fast Ramadan, and to pay zakah, and to make hajj. And if it goes beyond that, it is to make some dhikr when you have time. But those are the obvious worships. But Allah said, he did not create us except to worship him. Prayer, if you pray five times a day, every day, it doesn't take more than one hour. So did Allah create us just to be his for one hour a day? Just to be his for one hour a day? Or should the rest of our life be also a life of worship? The Prophet وسلم, teaches us that anything that we do in obedience to Allah or in following of the Prophet وسلم, and his sunnah with the intention of worshipping Allah is itself worship. So even the most mundane daily activities that we do without thinking, if you just think, and make the intention, you can turn those mundane activities, what you think they are useless or they are not worthy of your attention, you can turn them into ibadah, including your sleeping, including your eating, including feeding your child, or taking the hand of a person who's blind to cross the road with him. Doing something that is absolutely very simple can turn every second of your life into ibadah even if you do not do anything physical not to help yourself not to help anybody else but 
you live a life of reflection. Reflection is a ibadah that we tend to forget. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the wisest of believers as those who reflect and ponder and think of Allah by day and by night. وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ They reflect and ponder in what? The creation of heavens and earth. So a person who is napping or getting to sleep and he has nothing to do but either to make dhikr by his tongue or dhikr by his heart or thoughts in which he reflects in creation. What does the creation of heaven and earth mean for him? And then he would say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Rabbana, O Allah, our Lord, you've not created this in vain. This is ibadah. This is ibadah. Just to remember who the Creator is, how much bounties He has bestowed upon you, even though you may be at the moment the poorest person financially, the most undesirable person because you are and you are, but in the eyes of Allah, you are the most beloved. In the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Rubba ash'afa aghbar, law aqsama ala Allahi la abarra. Maybe a man whose hair is not combed, whose head is full of dust, it's like somebody traveling in the desert for a long time. That people care less for him. But in the eyes of Allah, if he swears for Allah to do something, Allah would do it. So we should not take people by how they look at the moment. We should not look at people just by appearance. Nor should we exaggerate what we don't know about them. We should just take their appearance. Umar ibn al-Khattab, their appearance in manners and behavior, not in the look. We should never evaluate a person by what they dress or how they look at the moment. We used to have somebody here who was despised, I could say, by many people. He used to stay in the masjid and he used to sit by himself because he had a phobia of disease. And people thought that he is something, something is wrong with him. This man, when he passed away, you could see on his face a smile that you never seen on him in this life, except very few occasions. So Umar ibn Khattab used to say, أَظْهِرُوا لَنَا أَحْسَنَ أَخْلَاقِكُمْ Show us the best of your manners. وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِالسَّرَائِرِ and Allah knows your secrets. So you may be the best between you and Allah. What people want of you is good manners, good words, good smile, good reception. So what matters to us is how somebody behaves, not how somebody looks. Somebody may look very awful because they are homeless. They have not taken a shower for a long time. They may even smell bad, but you should take their hand, help them take a shower, either in the masjid or somewhere else. If you could clothe them, that will be fine. If you could take their clothing and wash it for them, that will be great. But do not stop at judging. Most of us, unfortunately, we judge and we act on judgment. Let us be sure that the ultimate judgment is up to Allah. So we should never judge a person by their appearance, but we should take hints from his appearance as to what he needs of help that may be obvious. Some people need help, but it doesn't show. They may be dressed neatly. They may dress very nice, crisp clothing. They have showered, but they don't have the wealth you think they do. They may be even driving a car, but it doesn't matter. They may not have a job. Please, reach out to each other. When you see somebody who is silent all the time, somebody who is lonely all the time, it is our responsibility to get out of our seat, reach out, check on them.
If you see somebody that you have not seen before in the masjid, don't run away from them. They may be looking for you exactly because Allah might have given you something for them. This is what we need to look for. When you see somebody who is not a Muslim altogether, don't judge, help. This is the spirit of being a Muslim. And this is what a Muslim character should look like. A person who is ready to serve, not ready to judge. Not ready to judge. So judgment is not the most important thing. We leave it always to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in terms of being correct in our ibadah, we definitely need to go back to the sources. What can tell me, what are my sources for living as a Muslim, for worshiping as a Muslim? The Quran and the Sunnah. Most of us, unfortunately, we do not spend time or enough time with neither. Not the Quran, not the Sunnah of the Prophet But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that the Quran is light. That the Prophet وسلم, is light. That is the Prophet وسلم, and a clear guidance in the book. And Allah described Himself as Nur. And He described those who are living away from the Quran as living in Dhulumat, darkness. The word Dhulm and Dhulumat. They come from the same root, which is ظالama, to wrong somebody. When it is too dark, the likelihood of you tripping or making any mistake is much higher than when it is lit. So, ظلم and ظلمات, they come from the same root word and the same source. And the opposite is light. Knowledge in Islam is not only power as we say here, but knowledge is light. And the Quran makes a distinction between people who have knowledge and people who do not. And the similarities are someone who has life and someone who is dead. Someone who has life and someone who is dead. Dead means what? Dead. He killed himself by divorcing knowledge. And when we have knowledge and we act as if we didn't, we render ourselves dead even if we are alive. So knowledge is not itself the objective, but it is to turn it into light by using it. By applying knowledge into our life, we turn the light on. When we turn the light on, we see everything around us in the right perspective. But the only way we could see rightly is to look through the prism of the Quran. The Quran is the book that tells us what had happened, what is happening, and what will happen. So the only way to feel secure living as a Muslim is to connect deep with the Quran so that you know your history and you know what is being plotted against you as you speak, as you live on daily basis. And instead of reading the newspaper news, you read the greater news, an naba al azim which is the Quran, which is the news of what will happen to you. What is more important? To know that something happened in the street or to know that your house has been struck with lightning. Your house is more important. So one has to be careful that you collect the knowledge that benefits you first and you apply it and you teach it and you use it for your life and you do that in the spirit of humility. Because arrogance that comes with knowledge is no different than arrogance that comes with power. We tend to focus on the latter and ignore the first. Knowledge can turn a person into an arrogant person. I know more, I know better, I know deeper, nobody knows but me. That is arrogance. 
And arrogance is a devilish disease. It is a disease of Iblis, who says, Ana khayrum min. I am better than he is. He thinks he knows more. He thinks he was created from fire. He thinks he is closer to Allah. So he said, I am better than this new creation, Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refused this kind of argument and rendered it as arrogance. Aba was takbar. He refused and acted in arrogance. So when we study and we have more knowledge, we should have more humility. More humility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet وسلم, to constantly ask Allah for more knowledge. وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمَ And the Prophet وسلم, the more he had knowledge, the more humble he was, and the more humble he was instructed in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, وَخْفِدْ جَنَاحَكَ لِمَنِ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And lower your wings to those who followed you among the believers. To lower your wings is to be humble, is to be reachable, is to be accessible, is to be available when people need you as much as you can. Never shrug off anybody who needs you. So part of living as a Muslim is to live as a Muslim at home, as a Muslim in the masjid, as a Muslim in prayer, as a Muslim in your work, as a Muslim in the street. There is no sphere where Islam should ever be absent. Islam is your heart. Islam is your core. Islam is your essence as a human being and much more so as a believer. So the first issue related to ibadah is to know where to learn how to worship Allah. And I told you the story before of the three people who went extreme trying to worship Allah their way and the Prophet ﷺ told them it is not up to you. So ibadah in Islam to worship Allah in Islam must be on the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. You cannot worship Allah your way. You cannot say, I will make the Asr six rak'ah. It's much longer and much better and it feels good. Or I will make Fajr three rak'ah or four rak'ah. Allah set the ibadah. And as he did in the prayer, he did in other things, including where he asked you to do as much as you can, spending. Allah says, spend from what you have, what we have provided you. But still, he says, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَقْصُطْهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْصُورًا Do not choke yourself acting stingy and do not spread your hand loose that you lose all your money and then فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْصُورًا Everybody will blame you for turning yourself into a poor penniless person. So even in ibadah that is very desirable, Allah says, be moderate. So ibadah, we have to know that the source is the Quran and the Sunnah, and the way is the way of the Prophet, and how much of ibadah we do is to always be moderate. Then on the term moderate, I would be oblivious if I don't express the following. The term moderate and extreme and all of those terms, fanatic, radical, whatever, all of these are part of the psychological warfare against Muslims. And they used to be used in the early centuries of the Renaissance against committed conservative Christians. Those are loaded words and they have specific meaning that the person is targeted to be despised to be disassociated with and to be isolated and to be hated. We should not use those terms, but I am using them in the Islamic context. Moderate means somebody who does not go extreme right or extreme left. And the moderation is to follow the sunnah, to follow the straight path. So moderation in, as an Islamic term is not to divide truth and falsehood into two, 
and get the average. No, truth itself is moderation. Loving Allah all you can is moderation. So there is no moderation when it comes to connecting with Allah, loving Allah, remembering Allah. There's no moderation. Go as extreme as you can in remembering Allah 24 7. The Quran says, so that this is not my word, those who remember and mention Allah standing, laying down, and on their side. Is there any other position? Flying? Yes, flying. So that includes every position, every minute of your life. Mention and remember Allah as extensively as you can. You can never be called extreme. You can never be called extreme. And when somebody calls you extreme, don't accept it. Don't accept it. But there are extremism in actions. When you do something beyond what the Prophet ﷺ used to do, that becomes extreme according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, This religion is so solid. Enter into it smoothly and slowly. The one who runs his horse always to the maximum speed, he would lose his horse on the way. He would never cut the distance, nor would he have a horse to run with. The one who goes extreme, he doesn't keep his ride, nor does he cut the distance he wanted to cut. So we have to be moderate in our action. But in our remembrance of Allah, there is no limit. In fact, it is better not to set a limit. Okay? But the Prophet ﷺ set us some limits at certain times, even for dhikr. Even for dhikr. For example, after the prayer, yes, you can make as many tasbih and takbir, but the Prophet of Sunnah is to do 33, 33, and 33. That's a sunnah. So here, there is a limit. But you want to do any, anything more, that is fine. The Prophet ﷺ said the number of sunan that you do before or after prayer. And the number of rak'ah as sunnah before or after the prayer. Those we follow as is. We do not make them more. So there, whenever the Prophet speaks or acts, his is the limit. But whenever he opens the gate for you to go further, you go as far as you can. So the correctness of ibadah also includes that we should never leave out anything that constitutes ibadah and think that what I am doing is enough. So some of us think that ibadah comes in Ramadan and that praying taraweeh makes up for losing the prayer at other times. It does not. So whatever is fard is a minimum. Whatever is sunnah, it is a support augmenting system. So if you think of prayer, the main prayer, the fard prayer, as your main spiritual course, then the sunnah is the appetizer. The sunnah is the appetizer. And when you get lazy, you may not do the sunnah. If you are keeping the sunnah all the time, you may miss the sunnah, but you will not miss the fard. But if the fard is your maximum, and you get busy or get lazy, what will you use? lose? You will lose the fard. So there is no protection. So the sunnah is meant to be a protection for the fard. It is like having a fence around your home to protect against intruders. The sunnah protects your fard. So in ibadah, we seek what is fard first. Ramadan, fasting. But every day in the year, there is five time daily prayers that we should never miss. Some of us believe, I will not miss it. I will pray the five time prayers when I get home. That is already missing at least four times. 
when you wake out of your home without doing Fajr, you miss Fajr. When you don't pray Zuhr and Asr and Maghrib because you are in your business or you are on your way, you miss four times. When you pray everything at home, when you get home, you only make Isha on time. Would you hire someone who fails you 80% of the time? He doesn't come to your appointment 80% of the time. If you miss four prayers a day, you're missing 80% of what you should be doing. Would you continue to hire someone who misses your appointment 80% of the time? The answer is no. No wise businessman will do this, even if it were his son or his father. Period. Because money comes first, unfortunately. But the point I'm trying to make here is calculate in your head the worth of what you do and the worth of what you're missing. And let the word that Allah taught us come between you and your decision. What do I mean? When the Zuhr time comes and you are in your work and you are too busy and the boss is calling and the assistant boss is calling and there is a crisis in the office, right? And you know that if you follow the crisis, you will forget your salah. What do you do? Remember the word, Allahu Akbar. This is what prayer is about. Remember Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. He is greater than my boss. He is greater than my work. He is the one who provides me with the opportunity to work. And he is the one who is going to provide me with the next opportunity to work. So one should always be careful never to forget Allahu Akbar. Otherwise, you can waste your life never doing what you need to do and keep saying, when this happens, I will do this. When I get the next job, I will make sure. When I do this, this will happen. Those false promises never, never, or very rarely materialize. So, ibadah, there is spiritual ibadah between you and Allah, and there is ibadah between you and people. The Prophet ﷺ says, when you feed your wife or your child, it is counted as charity. Well, but isn't it mandatory that you do that? Of course it is. But out of his graciousness and generosity, Allah is telling us it counts as a charity. Why refuse it? Work for it. So make the intention. When you eat, isn't it a pleasure to have the food you like, right? You prepare it with your own hand and you spice it the way you like and you eat it. It should be delicious. Now you can turn it into ibadah. Why and how? If you don't turn it into ibadah, it is a wasted activity. It just goes to your stomach and your body and that's it. But if you make the intention that you are eating to keep your health so that you are able to worship Allah, you are able to serve His cause so that you remember the poor and the hungry and the homeless and the penniless as you are grateful for what Allah has provided you, you remember. So in the dua, Allahumma barik lana fi ma razaqtana wa qina adhab al Oh Allah, bless for us what you provided for us and protect us from hellfire. Why? What is the relationship? That if you act in tyranny because your stomach is full and your clothes are swollen and you're getting bigger every day, and you act arrogantly or in tyranny or oppression against others, this food and this power can lead you to hellfire. So Allah is reminding us in the Sunnah of the Prophet that as you eat, you remember who's providing you with food. So when you make dhikr, your eating becomes ibadah. When you make dhikr before you go to bed, your dhikr becomes ibadah. When you make dhikr as you lay your head on the pillow, your sleeping is ibadah. It's an amazing life to live as a Muslim. It's a very pleasant, happy life to live as a Muslim. When you think of people who need you, and you know that you don't have enough, and surely nobody can have enough. In the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, he says, إِنَّكُمْ لَن تَسَعُ النَّاسَ بِدُورِكُمْ 
وأموالكم You can never accommodate everybody in your home or through your resources and money فسعوهم بقلوبكم At least open your heart to them Give them love Give them care And much more importantly is to guide those who have the means to help those who don't. So the Quran blames those who don't have the means to help for not letting others know that someone needs their help. So I meet somebody who's poor or needy at the moment and I don't have the means to help him but I know that you could help him. I should reach out to you on his behalf and tell you X or Y or Z needs your help. Look after him. This is the least. So the Quran says, وَلَا تَحَادُّونَ عَلَىٰ طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ And you don't urge each other to feed the poor and the destitute. How come you don't do this? كَلَّا بَلْ لَا تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ You do not act generously towards the orphan. And you do not urge each other to support and provide for those who are needy and destitute. So brothers and sisters, ibadah is not just the prayer and fasting. Ibadah is as much cleaning your body, taking care of your hygiene, taking a shower on Friday before coming, cleaning your children, teaching them to be always clean and to keep up with their cleanliness, and to teach them to be organized to plan their life as you also should do so the Muslim is not just a person who is engaged in prayer and the rest of his life is different towards everything it has to be consistent may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us the way forward as Muslims and give us the knowledge and the discipline and the commitment to practice what we learn الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأصلي وأسلم على خير خلقه وخاتم رسله محمد بن عبد الله صفوته من خلقه وحبيبه وخاتم النبيين وخاتم المرسلين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Brothers and sisters Social worship is a worship that we forget to do. Reaching out to people who are mourning a deceased person. Reaching out to a sick person who may or may not need your physical support, but he must be in need of your spiritual support. Reaching out to elderly people who may need a ride, or may need somebody even to chat with because they are living alone is something that we forget to look after those elderly people. Brothers and sisters, worship is a word that is meant to permit, which means to be spread through all out every aspect of our life. As you breathe, you worship Allah. As you eat, you worship Allah. As you sleep, you worship Allah. This is living as a Muslim. And this is what will achieve what the ayah says, which I cited in the beginning. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا Allah did not create us except to worship Him. Which means any minute you do not worship is a minute wasted. Every minute that you don't worship Allah in any way of the worship that we just mentioned or any other way that we didn't, then this is a minute wasted. And imagine a simple act of not feeding a human being, not feeding an orphan, but feeding a cat or giving water to a dog could be the act, the act that will take you to paradise. It could be the act that will protect you from hellfire. So let worship be your way of life and let worship be your expression of Islam. 
let people see how Islam has made us the real greatest community that Allah has sent to mankind as the Quran tells us Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas You've been the best of nations sent out to mankind You are sent out, who sent you? Allah The Prophet وسلم, in his last days He used to say بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةٍ فَإِنَّهُ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِي Communicate on my behalf even if it is a single ayah, a single verse of the Quran, just communicate it. The only one ayah you know, just say it to someone who doesn't know it. Because it may be the ayah that may guide him and many, many people behind him. And in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu it is better for you that Allah would use you to guide a single human being than having the best of animals as your position or the best that the sun would have risen over. So let us take worship for the comprehensive concept it is in our life and not limit worship to just a prayer and fasting. We make a huge mistake when we make a recommendation for people based on I saw him praying in the masjid. While this is not a bad certificate to have, it's a nice one, very nice one, but it does not, it does not talk about the character. Some of us unfortunately have very good disciplined life when it comes to praying on time and even praying in the masjid. But when they are pushed or when they are angry, they show the other side of themselves, which is not very pleasant. So please, Look at people before you recommend them comprehensively. If a, a person coming to marry your daughter and you say, Alhamdulillah, he is musalli, he must be good. Not every musalli has good manners outside the masjid. So please, if we miss the concept that worship must be a comprehensive permitting way of life in every aspect of our life then we will use our faith in a way that is inappropriate actually we would abuse our faith not only as judges or of character but also by limiting our worship to what is not the limit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa qina wa sarif anna sharra ma qadayt اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته اللهم اغن السائلين من فضلك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغن السائلين بفضلك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم عليك بالظالمين المعتدين اللهم عليك بالطغاة الظالمين اللهم عليك بالطغاة الظالمين اللهم عليك بالطغاة الظالمين اللهم خذهم بددا وأحصهم عددا ولا تبق منهم أحدا اللهم لا تصل الظالما على المسلمين اللهم لا تصل الظالما على المسلمين اللهم لا تصل الظالما على المسلمين اللهم كما وعدت لا تجعل للكافرين على المؤمنين سبيلا اللهم لا تجعل للكافرين على المؤمنين سبيلا اللهم اغفر لنا ولآبائنا ولعلمائنا ولأبنائنا ولإخواننا ولأزواجنا وارحمنا جميعا برحمة واسعة تغنينا بها عن رحمة من سواك 
اللهم أحينا مسلمين وتوفنا مسلمين وبعثنا مسلمين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة